peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, good New City, happy last Sunday of 2020. Can I get a what what from your house? Some of us more than others have been so eager to make it through this year. It has been an unbelievable year, as you know. You lived through it. I um, during seminary, I had a uh, an experience working with the Send Network training team, and so guys would come in from all over the country, and we do these training cohorts to get them ready to go. Uh, train church planters in their city and it was this it was this big ordeal every time the guys would come in and the room was covered in post-it notes with all these inspirational quotes which sounds kind of tacky but um, there's this one that always caught my eye right as I walked in the room it said this evaluate I'm sorry it said experience is not the best teacher evaluated experience is the best teacher in other words if you go through something if you experience it but you don't you don't reflect on it. You don't think over what the Lord has been teaching you. Man, you, you punt on the gift that was the previous season. And hear me, you are left woefully unprepared for the season to come. If we experience together something like 2020 and we refuse to evaluate, man, what has the Lord been doing I mean, we don't have a shot as walking into 2020 being the kind of church that we want to be. We planted a church in this city that it might be renewed by the power of the gospel. And if we're going to have that kind of influence in this place, man, we have to ask some hard questions of ourselves. And hear me, we have to lay ourselves in dependence at the feet of King Jesus. That's why this morning, as you're tuning in, I want us to walk through three verses in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, I just want to give us really three quick encouragements here. As you're with your family on this last Sunday to help you debrief the previous year and look forward to the year that God has for us as a church family. Let me read the text. It says this, verse 4, chapter 4 in Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Look back there at the beginning of the text. The first encouragement, number one, rejoice seriously. You know what it means to rejoice? You remember the last time you rejoiced when your heart welled over the top 
with joy. As we're approaching having our second baby, it makes me think all the time about those moments when Bennett came into the world. This, this cry of victory as he came out and he looked me in the eyes for the first time. I remember feeling this surge of joy that just fell over the top of my life. That's part of what it means to rejoice at least. This overwhelming sense of finding joy in something. But there's another half of that coin, right? It's not just to delight and find joy. It's also a pursuit, right? Rejoice here is imperative. It's calling us. Paul right here is calling us to delight in something. Hear me real clearly, New City. Rejoicing isn't merely an attitude. It is a discipline. Rejoicing is a practice. The rejoicing picture that the New Testament gives us is not merely based on what mood you're in, on what you feel, or how your day has gone. Rejoicing is a decision that right here in the Bible we are being called by God to make. And it is the kind of decision that causes the delights of our hearts, that overflowing kind of enjoyment, to catch up with what we know to be true. What is the object of our rejoicing to be? What are we to discipline ourselves toward? What are we to celebrate and gush over? The text tells us, rejoice in the Lord. The object of your rejoicing, New City, is compassionate King Jesus, who sees all the rubble of your broken dreams of 2020, who sees the deepest and most grievous of hurts, King Jesus, who is wise for life, when you experience, as everyone else in 2020 experienced, this overwhelming sense of uncertainty about the future, Jesus is perfectly wise for life, and he's willing to share. King Jesus, who is holy who is set apart as altogether different, when you again and again heard the news cycle of the election season and you were reminded that there is no ruler in this world who can save or satisfy you, King Jesus is altogether different. He rules in a way that nobody else can rule. As the cry from millions of Americans went up for justice or racial reconciliation in this world, hear me, King Jesus is perfectly just. He satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf. He is meant to be the object of your rejoicing. That matters now more than ever. In a world of COVID, of interrupted plans, of everything that we've gone through over the last year, Having an object of our rejoicing that can actually handle the weight of the human heart is the only way forward. This, friends, this place is right where Jesus does some of his best work. Here's the question for us. Are you paying attention? Are you rejoicing seriously? Are we, as a people, meeting the circumstances of the previous year with a reminder of the safe, keeping, and caring work of Jesus. Hear me. Right now, I want to encourage you to a practice in this moment. For every worry, every anxiety that your heart and your mind start bouncing around, I want you to think about two realities about your King Jesus. That's part of how we we take the Bible up on its command to rejoice seriously. When your life is unpredictable, guess what? Jesus is unchanging and faithful. When your anger at your neighbor who has a wildly different worldview than you won't seem to subside, Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he has stilled the righteous anger of God toward you. Where you are opposed by the enemy the devil or, or the desires of your flesh begin to run out of control. Guess what? Jesus has conquered Satan, death, and hell forever. When you are confronted with your utter inability to change yourself, 
Jesus stood in your place for your sins and invites you into the transforming and renewing power of his yoke. This new city is what we do. We as a people rejoice seriously. And guess what being a rejoicing kind of people leads to? Look at verse 5. It tells us, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. When we become a people who rejoice seriously, guess what? We become a people of counter-cultural reasonableness. Think about the chaos of our world right now. Think about all the baggage that our world that doesn't know Jesus, our city that doesn't know Jesus is carrying in to the new year. What if right in that space, we became a people of sober-mindedness? Meaning we're just, we have this sense of calm We're not naive about what's going on in the world, but we just have this this sense of overgirding hope that holds us up. What if revival in our city in the next season looks more like a group of undeniably steady people than it looks like a building full of people? Guess what? The next season, who knows how long until people go back to quote-unquote normal in wanting to be around others. That is not the question for us. The question for us is who will we be as the people of God in this city? Will we take Jesus up on his invitation to rejoice seriously? For some of us, we're having a hard time wrapping our mind around what there is to rejoice about. For some of us, this has been an undeniably hard year. Jesus has something for us. Hang with me. That's point three. Point two first. Obey eagerly. Obey eagerly. Did you notice what the text says in verse six? It says, do not be anxious about anything You know what the word anything, the Greek right there, you know what that means? It means anything, nothing. Be anxious about no single thing. This is a command in the Bible. And guess what? When we come to a command in the Bible, we have really one of two options. One, we can position ourselves against the command and believe that God is robbing us of something by saying, don't go here. Or two, We can be a people that have first rejoiced and trusted in the character of our God. And then we see a command and we go, why wouldn't I trust you? Why wouldn't I throw the weight of my life on you? Why wouldn't I hear your command as a life-giving invitation rather than an identity-robbing command? The command here that we are to obey eagerly, is not to be anxious. You know what anxiety is, right? When I say anxiety, something comes into your mind. Just a few weeks ago in the Sermon on the Mount this last fall, we talked about anxiety because that's where Jesus took us. And one of the things I said about defining anxiety was this. Anxiety is when the uncertain future becomes more real to our hearts than the present character of God. You hear that? When we begin to think about what's what's coming, what's around the bend, what if the vaccine doesn't work? What if my kids can't go back to normal rhythms of, of class? What if I lose my job? What if business slows down? What if, we, uh, what if our home gets foreclosed on because I'm not making half the amount of money that I was before? See, all of those things have yet to happen. And when we disobey the Bible's command to not be anxious, we look at that reality and believe it as though it's a certain fact. But guess what? Regardless of if all those things happen, Jesus Christ has not turned his back on you. 
His tangible presence right now in this moment, his long-suffering, his patience, his beauty, his glory, his, his ability to provide for his people is more real right now, it is as real right now, than it has been forever. Like, is that real to your heart right now? That when Jesus says, don't be anxious, he's not just calling you away from anxiety, that he's actually calling you to himself? Only Jesus doesn't say, don't be anxious in a vacuum. Anybody can say, don't be anxious, right? Who other than Jesus can say it and show up the way he does? Can I just tell you, in, in the experience of moving and planting a church and being in ministry and going through seminary of all the, all the legs of the journey that the Lord has had in, in our story, like if you look at the math on paper, it doesn't make sense. The way that the Lord has provided the way that the Lord has cared for us, the way that like somehow we're going through seminary and broke and in this little apartment and, and having a baby and all the things that were happening in our lives. And yet the Lord continued to provide again and again and again. Friends, if your experience right now cannot tell you that the Lord is worthy of your trust, will you just hear your brother right now? Not in a sense of like bragging or boasting, but hear me, a real sense of boasting in the Lord. What if you trusted him? What if you rejected anxiety and you took him up on his invitation into his own heart? New City, we must be a people who obey eagerly. Hear me, ministry for all of us in 2021 is going to give us plenty of reasons to be anxious. You know that, right? As you begin to start to bear the weight of others who have gone through hell this last year, we're going to have every temptation in the world to carry that anxiety on our shoulders. Do not be anxious. You give the weight of those burdens to your Father. And you watch him carry us through, providing for us in ways that we cannot even imagine. Number three. Number three. Pray thankfully. Pray thankfully. Look back at the Bible. It says, Do not be anxious about anything here. Let's pick up. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'm almost done here. Paul ties prayer and thanksgiving together. He tells us when we go to God in prayer, we have to pay attention to what the Lord is already doing around us. This is for you who are struggling to rejoice in God here at the end of 2020. When you come to the end of this year and you begin to look around, our temptation is going to be look at everything that's gone wrong and to ask God, where were you when everything went wrong? But here's what I know about your father. Everything that went right in 2020 was a gift from his heart. And everything that went wrong was a tool in his hands to shape you more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Nothing is wasted in the hands of our Redeemer. Not a thing and so when you begin to pray, when you begin to go, go after his presence and consider and think and, and express your heart to God and ask him to provide, guess what you can do that with? Complete trust and thankfulness. What went right in 2020? Will you tell your father? Will you thank him? When that becomes our posture, something beautiful happens. Did you see? The peace of God guards our hearts. He protects us. He shields us. 
the attitude of the world is overwhelming cynicism. It's an attitude that says, yeah, maybe God did that, but there's no way, he, there's no way he's going to show up again. There's no way we can presume on the faithfulness of God. Friend, Jesus in his cross has shown us that he shows up for his people. He just does. He just does. And so friends, as a church family, we must be a people who pray thankfully. Can we just think for a moment about what God has done in the last, in the last year and a half through the formation of this church? We've seen six people say yes to Jesus for the first time in a meaningful sense. We saw two people baptized at launch Sunday. Over a hundred next steps in relationship with Jesus have at least been expressed as like, man, I want to be involved in community. I want to serve. I want to learn how to read my Bible. Those kind of things. The Lord has shown up. His presence has been with us from the beginning. And not to mention, as Redeemer Church closed out a chapter of ministry in our city, and at least 20 of their people jumped in with the launch team of New City, guess what? We saw the Lord show up. There are horror stories about situations like that on the internet you can read, but guess what? The Lord has prevailed. We have so much to be thankful for. And finally, here's the last piece. We get to together thank the Lord for, for, for providing a long-term home for New City Church. Right now, we are in the process of getting everything straightened out in the leasing agreement with a facility over on Fox Drive on the other side of campus from where we are right now. And now I want you, I know that immediately invites questions. I want you to go snoop around on Fox Drive, see what you can see over there, F try to figure out where it's at. Here's what I promise you. As more details unfold, we want to keep you in the loop. So right now, take your phone out, text renovation, all one word, renovation, to 97,000. And that's going to subscribe you as there are volunteering opportunities to get the space ready for us, as there are um, ways for you to serve and engage. Um, we're going to keep you updated. You just need to sign up via that channel. Renovation, all one word, to 97,000. New City Church, I am convinced that we can trust our Father in rejecting anxiety, in leaning into King Jesus, and seeing the beauty and glory of what he's going to do in this city all through the power of his gospel.